All right. Well, I think as uh, people are still joining us, we can uh, get started because we do have a very uh, busy couple of hours here planned. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Lexi Adsit. I am the executive director uh, at Trans Can Work. And um, this is in partnership with the very wonderful California LGBTQ uh, Health and Human Services Network. Um, and there's been a lot of exciting developments within the California Department of Health, um, the Office of Health Equity, and uh, the Gender Health Equity Session and section and so um they've also been a part of organizing this and uh we wanted to demystify and i think create some more accessibility on um how to apply for jobs within the state of california uh answer some questions about why it takes so long um and Later on, we'll also be hearing from a number of employees within the state who uh, all fall under the LGBTQ plus umbrella um, to share their personal insights. And so uh, maybe we can start with just Danny, Jason, and Preet, all of you introducing yourselves um, and where you are, who you're affiliated with. Sure, thank you, Lexi. Um, my name is Danny Sesenia. My pronouns are he and they, and I am the director of the California LGBTQ Health and Human Services Network. Um, I'm really excited for this webinar today and um, all of the amazing things that folks are gonna learn and such. Um, so I just want folks to know that if you have any questions or concerns or thoughts, please feel free to put it in the chat box and we are more than happy to answer those questions. Uh, we will either answer it directly in the chat box um, or uh, we will ping whoever is facilitating at the moment to ensure that uh, your question is read out loud and answered. Um, I do want to make uh, one disclosure, which is that this is not a webinar um, to discuss funding or any upcoming funding when it comes to the LBTQ grant or the Trans Health and Wellness grant. Um, this is strictly about um, how to apply, you know, at the California Department of Public Health. Um, so any funding questions that you may have, please save for the community town halls that take place um, that CDPH advertises. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Jason to introduce himself. Hi there, everyone. My name is Jason Tesher, and I'm with the Gender Health Equity Unit inside the Office of Health Equity at the, I'm trying to point to the right thing, at the California Department of Public Health. Um, uh, uh, and we, we are also extremely excited um, to, uh, uh, to be here, and I'll be talking a little bit about kind of what we do uh, in 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 a little bit, and we're very excited. Thank you for for being here uh, to to learn about this process. I'll hand it over to Preet. Thank you, Jason. My name is Preet Goodball, and I'm with California Department of Public Health, the Office of Health Equity. I'm over the uh, uh, the administration and operations. Um, I'm the chief over that uh, uh, section. Um, and I work very closely with Jason and getting all of our uh, reorgs and and structure done as we develop this program. So thank you for having me. Awesome. And um, I forgot if Danny mentioned this, but just a reminder, this is being recorded. So uh, it'll be up on both our websites and uh, we'll send out links uh, about where you can watch it again in case uh, you miss something or have a friend who might want to watch it um, or your uh, LGBTQ serving agency uh, with job seekers. Um, so Jason, do you want to introduce uh, the Department of Public Health and Office of Health Equity? Yeah, sure. I'm going to do this really quickly. And by the way, I, my apologies, like uh, Jason Tesher, he, him pronouns, 
with the gender health equity unit. Um, and um, so just just so you know, um, what we're going to talk about is um, in terms of uh, applying for a state job is, is it is inclusive of all state jobs. Um, and so it's not just here at the Department of Public Health. Um, but we are very interested um, at the department and inside of the Office of Health Equity, and especially inside of the Gender Health Equity section, of um, ensuring that um, that the folks who um, who are are working with us and making decisions represent the communities that we serve. And it's a very important uh, part of of of, uh, of the work we do. The Department of a Pub of Public Health is a large department, um, and we we work to protect the public's health in in the state, um, shaping positive outcomes for for individuals and families and communities. And we have so many different programs um, that we could possibly go through all of them now. They range from um, uh, maternal and child health programs to um, monitoring uh, uh, the safety of cosmetics to monitoring laboratories. And so we just have this huge, uh, array of work that we do. In, um, in the Office of Health Equity, um, we were established um, uh, uh, to focus on promoting equitable social, economic, and environmental conditions uh, uh, to achieve optimal like health, mental health, and well-being in California. And so we, we focus um, at a state level and in terms of infusing racial health equity, um, health equity around climate change, uh, uh, gender uh, and sexual orientation, health equity issues like policy work, where we can say to you know to to other places, uh, we have programs that come to us and they say, what can we do to make this more equitable? We give them advice, we give them guidance. We also run programs, and as uh, as we've mentioned before, like we fund. Uh, activities when we have, when the legislature says, here, we'd like you to do this, like the Transgender, Gender Nonconforming and Intersex Fund. Um, and, um, and the Gender Health Equity section inside of the Office of Health Equity, um, we are primarily focused on um, issues of health equity that impact um, gender and sexual minorities. And also, we are working on issues around abortion and reproductive freedom and abortion access. Um, and so we not only have grant programs, but we also work like at, the, at, at this level where we, we offer advice across the department and guidance about sexual orientation and gender identity, identity data collection, how to make sure our communities are visible. Um, and, um, and we are very excited about the work we do. We are very mission driven. I can say that for, for, for all of, uh, most of CDPH's staff, um, but uh, especially, especially in the Office of Health Equity. Um, so with that said, um, just give you the, the briefest of, of overviews of the department. Um, uh, I wanna turn it over to, um, uh, to Preet. Um, and I, I really wanna thank uh, Preet for being here and helping and helping us. We're we are staffing up a lot around the department. It is not just the Office of Health Equity and the Gender Health Equity section. Our section is going from three people to 17 in the next year. Um, uh, the Office of Health Equity is what going to triple Preet um, uh, soon. And there are hundreds and hundreds of positions available. Uh, we know that the way to get a state job hasn't always been transparent and is challenging. Civil service is, is, a, is a, 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 it, it makes the process, um, it protects uh, employees, but it also makes the process a little bit challenging sometimes. So um, here we go, trying to demystify this. Um, there's gonna be plenty of room for questions and answers. Um, and later on, I'm very excited about the panel that we're gonna have of queer folk in, um, uh, in the department to talk about what it's like to work here. So with that, Preet. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Um, so I wanted to take this opportunity and, and when Jason asked, I, I jumped on it because I really do want to mystify what it takes to really get into state work. Um, we need you. 
Um, and so any way that we can help cater and nurture that um, to bring you on board, we are so open to doing that. Um, I have spent um, 25 years in state service and 17 years in local service. Um, and I have had just the honor and the privilege to learn so many of these systems and bring on so many people. Um, it's just really understanding how to navigate. And when you go onto the website, it can be scary. Um, it could be scary, but it, it could be also daunting in the sense that where do I go and look for this information and what does this this mean? Um, there's so many just different terms and when you don't know what it takes to even get into a certain classification, it's like, what classification do I even qualify for and what does that mean? So I'm going to go through the general classifications, but I'm also going to go into a little bit of the health program positions. Um, so I'll give you um, just a high level view of those, but feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'm available. You can, you know, navigate through Jason. I'm always, you know, I'll always make time to do this. So I think it's really, really important. This is how we get good people on our, on, on this type of work um, and really be the voice um, for, the, for our communities that we want to serve. Um, my career, just so that you know, when we talk about entry level, sometimes it feels like a really entry level. I started 25 years ago, um, almost 25 years ago, um, as a permanent intermittent employee. And what that meant for me was as a student, I was coming in um, only when they needed. It wasn't even a part-time position. It was literally just getting my foot in and just started from that. Um, and then people within the department, and it was with corrections. And, and from within that, people showed me and helped me navigate through the process. And from there, I became an analyst. From the analyst position, I all of a sudden jumped into management. And I've been in regional efforts on, in management. I've been in, up all the way up to executive levels. Um, so the journey is, it just starts um, once you get in. So please don't feel like, oh my God, I'm going to go into an entry level, but I have all of this other experience. Unfortunately, when we get into a new process, we have to start somewhere. And so I'm going to really encourage you to take on whatever levels that you can, put your foot in there, because then the doors just start opening, um, because the passion will guide you. So go with your heart. I tell this to everybody, and sometimes it feels like it's really woo-woo, but... <laughs> But it does, it takes it takes your heart and compassion, which all of you have. That's why you're here. You wanna, you wanna understand that process. So let me help you navigate through that. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna share my screen. I don't have slides because I actually go on the website to navigate with you and show you what to click and where to go. Um, so take notes. And again, we're, we're open to answering any questions and feel free to circle back with us if you get stuck, okay? Um, as I share the screen, sometimes when we go to another page, we have to unshare and reshare. So if if for some reason we lose that, just just tell somebody tell me that oh we're still on that previous page. Where'd you go? I'll, I'll get I'll do an unshare and do a share again. Sometimes that happens when we we use the website, but I think it's a better visual than trying to uh, put some slides together that don't match. So. Okay, what you should be seeing right now is a CalHR web page. Is that what everybody is seeing? Okay. Yep. Okay. So um, here's the the web page. So it's it's calhr.ca.gov. So that's where you're gonna go. And when you go there, this is their home page. When you come here, um, there's a lot of information. Okay. Um, but I'm going to have you go straight to job seekers. And the reason I'm going to have you go here is the number one thing I want you to do is create an account. 
once you have an account, when you're ready to apply, whether it's for an exam or even if it's for a position, all you have to literally do is click apply um, and it will auto populate all your information. You may have some updates if you've changed your job or maybe you took on um, some voluntary position that you wanna add on, or maybe you got certified in some area that you wanna add on as certification. So number one thing that I'm gonna advise you to do and encourage you to do is it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of effort because have your resume in front of you um, because it will basically ask you all your uh, experiences um, when it comes to your work, as well as uh, school, your education, any community efforts, any certifications that you may have. So basically, it's an application process, but I want you to hit apply. And when you get to the apply, um, you are going to, it blocks me, I'm going to X that out. Um, you're going to come up here to the far right corner, and you're gonna go ahead and create yourself an account, create an account here. And when you hit that, you see it starts, it's gonna have you plug in all of this information. So just follow through. And like I said, this will take you a little bit of time. It'll make it easier if you have your resume and a list of all your employment, as well as your education, anything that you wanna basically put in the application in front of you, okay? Um, so then once you have the account, I'm going to go back. Um, so then you can go ahead and go into getting a job. And when you come into the job, here's a couple of um, classifications that you want. And, and Jason, maybe you can put these in the chat. Um, some of the classifications at, at the beginning um, that most of you will most qualify. Um, is the staff services analyst position. If you have a bachelor's degree, you can even jump up to the potential of jumping up to the associate governmental program analyst positions. And there's also the health program series. So you've got the health program specialist. Those are entry levels. And I would probably glean on those right from the beginning. Um, some of you might be interested in data and research and numbers, if that's your game. Um, you can also do the research scientist series. So for any one of these, I believe Jason's putting those all in the chat. Um, for any one of those positions, first of all, you got to get yourself onto a cert list. And you do a cert list by taking the exam. Don't freak out. <laughs> the exams are not like, you know, oh my God, I got to dig back my calculus books and all my science books. It's nothing like that. <laughs> so the exams are very uh, much around your training and your experience. Um, it's almost like a self audit of yourself, <laughs> you know, like how many years of experience do you have? How much education? Basically, you'll, a lot of them are multiple choice. Um, it's really just time consuming, but you need to do that. And, and you do that because it puts you on what we call a cert list. The cert lists, lists are ranked then. So for any one of these positions, what you want to do is you want to hit the exam side. So you're going to come to this third button here. When you come to this third button, those keywords are those positions that I just uh, gave, um, and those are in the chat. Um, and that's and unfortunately, our systems are a little ar archaic, um, so you do actually have to type the entire classification in here. It won't. You can't just type a certain one. It doesn't. It throws you off. So type up the whole classification. So for instance, staff, services, analyst, okay? So when you do that and hit enter, it will take you to that exam. Okay, see, I missed an S. See how sensitive that was? <laughs> so even though it said keyword, yeah, I got some keywords in there, but it still won't take it. So you have to, you do have to 
put the entire. So see, just with missing an S, it didn't take me there. So you, once you type that in, it will actually take you to the exam. When you go into the exam, here's the neat thing about these exams. You can actually go into these and you can actually get a copy of the exam. So I'm telling you, it's 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 not as scary as it feels or when you think about an exam, it's it, it's all there for you. The, the worst part about this entire process is just time consuming. <laughs> so um, so put yourself first, put yourself ahead and, and um, you know, block out some time so that you can do these. But what you will do here is you will see right here, it'll say click here for a copy of the official exam bulletin and take the exam. So you can actually go in there and you can get a copy. Um, it will also give you classification, you know, descriptions. If you want to go into that, I'm already telling you, most of you will probably qualify for this one just right today. Um, so feel free to go, go in there and do that. But once you're ready to do that, you're just going to go ahead and click on here and you're going to go ahead and I'm obviously not going to take the exam right now, but um, you will just go in here and you will take the exam run through it gives you basically what the position is and then I think it's towards the tail end you will go ahead and see here's preview the staff services training and experience evaluation that's the exam so when you click on that that gives you the copy okay so you did print this out you can actually take the take the exam and then go back in and log in and plug in all your answers Okay, so I hope that helps and kind of gets the angst out of just how to how to at least do the exam. I'm going to stop at that point, at this point right now, and stop sharing and see if there's any questions. Yeah, we got um, a couple questions. Yeah. So I know, I think right as you were getting started, there was a question about, is there any data that reflects the hiring of LGBTQ uh, Q2S plus people uh, at the state or county and city levels? Also, is there any of that information by race and ethnicity? I don't have any, unfortunately, I don't, I didn't come with any of that information. So I'm here just to help explain the process. I don't have the stats um, when it comes to that. So it's a really good question. And also it's a pretty, uh, uh, I am happy to um, send a message and ask around for what data exists uh, uh, around that. One of the things that we'll note is that because we're, we're because this is a civil service um, a hiring process, it's meant to focus on it. It, it focuses on uh, equality, and so to that end, oftentimes folks are not asked those questions because it has to be a blind. You know, according to state law, it has to be a blind process, um, and uh, uh, and you know, we asked we we ask about people's experience doing doing certain works or experience working in particular communities, but not necessarily uh, what communities they belong to or how they identify. That helps. Awesome. Um, there was also a question that just got sent to me personally about background checks and if people had been uh, convicted, if there was any sort of disqualifier around that. There is a question on the application that does ask if you do have any background of that, and and it's it depends on the 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 department that's hiring. Uh, for instance, I come from corrections, and so immediately we go through a background check. So we get fingerprinted. We you know we we go through that. When I came, when I went to other agencies, that wasn't the case. So it really just depends sometimes on the department. When I came to CDPH, that I didn't get fingerprinted, um, but your state application does have that question on there. Um, and then it really depends. I've hired people who had multiple DUIs, but were clear and went through, you know, so, you know, we're not gonna ding you for, we, we've all done something, right? Like it's just, but if, if you've done the work, and you're, you're a positive reflection on the community, we want you, we want you here. 
And, you know, so, so even if you ding the yes, please be honest on your applications because, you know, there are checks that are done. And I, so just, that's, that's really, I mean, we're here to support you in any way that we can, but um, depending on the department, there, there are fingerprinting, there's complete background checks on some, some agencies, and in some there's not, but but be honest, because it, it will come up depending on reference checks and things. Yeah, and I, I've been in state government since 2011, and I've never had a background check run. I have, however, been in positions, uh, actually pretty much since, since I began, where I have to file a conflict of interest form with the state, um, acknowledging like where I get my income from and where my where my spouse gets their income from, um, because sometimes we're making decisions about who gets money where, and it's got to be a super transparent process about whether or not we have connections um, anywhere that might uh, cause a conflict. And so um, that's that that is uh, that is something that that will be seen depending on the level of position. Um, so one question I had, and I know mostly because the way politics shifts throughout the country within the state, um, are, and you mentioned CDPH is growing, are uh, these jobs permanent or are they kind of susceptible to the will of uh, our elected representatives in terms of like the way that budgets can get cut or grown um, depending on the season? No, no, these are not directly. So departments um, get their funding. Um, some cases, um, if the funding is coming from a grant that may end, um, they they are called limited positions. And you'll see those in the advertisement. Um, but even with the limited, we are always looking to make sure that once we bring you in, we find the funding to make it permanent. We don't guarantee it up front, but we do always look to do that. But most of the positions that we're gonna be doing at CDPH are permanent funding. Um, so what, we, what we've done is we've already gone through the process. We have programs that are already passed by the governor's office through the budget process. So we have those fundings and that's how we're gonna to continue to move and grow. Um, so they are permanent funding when we do, when we do go out. And pre, um, once you pass your one year probation period, um, uh, regardless of whether you're in a limited term position, um, there's opportunities to move around. Yeah. Is that all right? Like once you once you get there, and so so it's really super rare to see like us hire people for a program that lasts one year, because it takes so long to get people on board. Uh, and so that that situation doesn't doesn't really occur occur occur, and we kind of really know. I started in a limited term position, um, working at the California Department of Insurance, um, and then a couple of years down the road, they they you know they worked to to change it, and so. And it doesn't necessarily take. I, I just want to reassure folks that it doesn't necessarily take a long time to get in once you apply. It does take on our end to get the funding, it takes us a while. So when Jason said it takes a while to get, um, I think it's more of the timeline of what it takes us to get the funding. I mean, sometimes we're working on this funding two years, a year before you even see the end result. When we post, we typically are moving pretty fast. I'll just give you an example. My neighbor actually came by um, back in the spring and said, you know what, I, I really want to get into state service. And um, so he was you know, going from private sector to, to the public sector. And I sat down with him, showed him exactly what I'm showing you today. Um, and he applied in April and he, he went through three interviews and he got his position in July. So, um, you know, but that's just because, and that's only because once we post, there's a minimum 10 day posting for us. We have to post a position for 10 days. If it if there are positions where 
they take a little bit longer or we're really diving into getting more applications, you'll see the posting go a little bit longer. It may be 15 days, it may be 30 days, um, depending on maybe it's an entire region that we're trying to hire for. So we'll put the recruitment out for a little bit longer, um, sometimes even up to 30 days. So when we do that, just think about it, that's 30 days right there. Once we get the applications, we still have to vet through. So this cert list, the examination, we do, we create a cert list and everybody is ranked. There's the ranking of one, two, three, four, five, and it, it goes on. Um, you are hired within the first three rankings. Now, with that being said, most people will not rank in the first one unless you're a veteran. Okay, so those are ranking ones because we give additional points if you are a veteran. So I just want to share that out too. That's just like some people are like, oh, God, I didn't get ranked up there on number one or two. And a lot of times those positions are already kind of vetted. That doesn't mean that you don't get in. It, we have to clear the list and typically rank one will go by really fast because we don't have a lot of people on them. So we automatically jump right into the twos and threes and fours and fives. Um, and we have to kind of go in that sequence too. So that's part of the civil service. So for some of you who, who might rank down in maybe five, it may take a little bit longer than those who rank in three. I mean, that's just how it works. Um, uh, but Here's the other thing, even if you get a hundred, even if you get like the highest of the highest scores on your exam, you'll only get a 95. <laughs> okay, so, so for those of us who are like type A and we're looking for that hundred <laughs> percent, we're not going to get it. <laughs> so, and, and the reason for that is because that, that rank one is set outside for veterans. Okay. So um, just giving you a heads up on that. So don't, don't feel like, oh my God, where, where did I not get my points? Um, it's just set aside for that today. <laughs> awesome. Um, so just, can, so we did get some questions, but we're answering other questions. Uh, so there's one here about, um, am I supposed to edit the PDF or do I print out that exam file and do it by hand or where do you go to input the answers digitally? So what I did is when I clicked it, that was a preview. That's why it came in that. Um, but when you actually go into the exam, it's actually, you, you'll fill it in on the exam. And then when you hit the submit button, it goes where it goes. And you will instantly get your score. So you're not waiting on it. You, you will get an instant. I mean, literally when you hit submit, you will you will get your results. The only ones that you won't get the results on quickly are the HP series, which is the health program series, um, because some of those questions might be written. I'm not, um, I didn't open the last health program series one, and the specialist one might still be multiple choice. There might be some paragraph um, ones, but what they do is they will take those aside and they review those aside. And I think it takes an additional week or two to get those back. Um, so there's a little bit of longer process if it's a little bit of the written side of it too. But, but otherwise you will get your instant results from the exam. Great. Um, there was a question about uh, cannabis use or I'm just guessing we could just say drug screening <laughs> generally, um, but does California uh, uh, screen uh, before making a hire? That and That's the same thing again with departments. Um, so when I was at corrections, yes, we had drug screening. Um, other departments that I've been to, not necessarily. Um, you know, that's all I can really say about that. And then everybody has a different policy, different regs um, and what needs to be provided. So it goes department to department. And I, 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 am, I am fairly certain that CDPH does not, specifically for cannabis, does not um, uh, 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 screen for, for, uh, uh, for that. Um, uh, and again, like you said, it's, it's department, but it's also job 
specific. If you're applying for a job in Caltrans and you're working with equipment, they may have some, you know, yeah. some requirements, but that will be stated super clearly on the, um, on the, on the, the application, like, you know, what other requirements are, are needed. Um, so. And, and, and to, that's why I indicated department wide. So each department is going to base it differently. Um, so it could be a, just a department wide. It could be, I can't see a department only doing it for certain sections. Um, that's not something that I've seen done. If it's the entire department, it's the entire department. Everybody's going to go through it. Um, and yeah, so. Awesome. Um, bunch of questions coming in. Uh, so I'm trying to <laughs> filter through it. Uh, so somebody observed most of the job bulletins have the following statement. One year of experience in the California State Service performing duties equivalent to dot, dot, dot. How can we interpret that? I have worked for the county in the CSU system, so I'm unsure if that would qualify under uh, that specific qualification. There's typically two. So you'll see typically two situation scenarios on there. You'll see one year within state service, and then I'll have in a very small print or and then I'll say something else where you can have other experience that is equivalent and they'll go ahead and do that. And um, so the SSA positions, the positions that I uh, listed for you, those are entry levels. So most people, I, I have students that come in, you know, so it's like they're just graduating and they're just getting their career started. So um, so really, it's, that's why there's the little or in there. It could say and or. Um, so just if you could, if you just scroll down a little bit further from the first selection, go a little bit further, you'll you'll see other avenues. But for the most part, you you can get into these levels if you have a bachelor's degree um, or without any problems. Um. Right. Uh, Javier, I know you have your hand up. Do you want to, um, can we unmute him to ask his question? Yeah, I can unmute myself. Is that okay? Oh, there you go. Yeah, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Yeah, no, this is incredibly helpful. Oh my goodness. I feel like even, it can be so intimidating even when you're like, I know the internet, but that's not true at all. But um, yeah, my question is, could you walk, so I have two questions. Could you, one, walk me, walk us through a little bit more of like the background check? I think for me, um, I had a city, a local city job under my dead name. And so a lot of times it's very uncomfortable for me to out myself on an application for obvious reasons, um, but I'm not trying to lie, right? So I, I think that's sort of just getting a sense of like, how can I fill out that application without maybe necessarily outing myself in a, in a job application, especially one that I want, <laughs> you know? Um, and then, and I think just knowing what the background search is, is really helpful. Um, Cause I think also like, even when I use like a car that may not reflect my current name, people often mark it as fraud for, you know, cause it just, you know, people are doing their jobs, but like, I don't want that to be flagged. So like is not putting, previous names going to be like an instant this is marked for fraud not going to get um you know you, you know what I mean because I think that happens like with my car you know financial information which is helpful but also a really big pain and I don't want to disqualify myself through a technicality but I also again don't want to out myself if I don't need to um second um could you tell me more about uh like when we are applying how much time do you think we should set aside to just go through the application, get comfortable with it? Um, and then, you know, when you do do the exam, like, would you set aside like 30 minutes, an hour? Is it like filling out your LinkedIn application kind of thing? Um, or is it going to require, you know, maybe, because even, even if someone asked me to do any type of statistics right now, I'm like, okay, wait one second, you know? So yeah, I think just getting a better sense of those two would be really helpful. Absolutely. Those were some great questions. Thank you. So um, one on the background checks, like I said, not every department does it. And I'm so sorry that you you go through those type of experiences and my heart is with you. 
um, please just um, on your applications, there's no ask of, of any of that. Be true and be authentic who you are today, sitting as you are. Um, the background checks, those, I, there's not a lot of departments that do the background checks. It's really more in the criminal justice areas, the DOJs, the corrections. Um, but for the most part, I think you'll be okay um, if you run into any of those problems. And just from my own experience as well, and to navigate this in the HR world, um, uh, please circle back with me. Um, because this is a, our heart is there to help. And if those, those concerns are happening and you are not able to step in and, and, and get positions within state government because of that, um, I want to know, me as a person who is driving to get folks in, and, um, I, I want to be a part of that and to help you guide through. Um, I personally have not had those experiences, so I cannot sit here and speak of those, but, I, but I, I want to be able to help and get the information and be able to be that voice to, to make progress in that, in that arena for you. Um, the, the background checks should not be affecting that. Um, financial, you know, we don't do any of that. You know, there's no... Uh, investment, uh, you know, this is the public sector. So I'm hoping that you're not challenged in, in that. So all I can say is just please reach back out if you do find any of those circumstances so that we can be a voice in that. Um, as far as getting prepared for the exam, I would really um, probably when you're first navigating and creating your accounts and so forth, I would just- Something went wrong. Please try again. My phone's talking to me. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. There's no idea. Um, I, I would set aside probably two hours. Um, if you spend too much time uh, aside from that, just like as if you're doing anything else, you kind of wear yourself out. So just log out after, you know, two hours. You, that should be plenty of time to do an application, create an account, get a copy of the exam, go through the exam. The exam, the first time, even when you have a copy in front of you, will not take more than an hour. And then when you log in, um, if you've already printed everything out and you have everything circled, it will, by the time you hit the apply button, everything auto populates, I would say probably 30 minutes to 45 minutes to actually submit something. Yeah, thank you so much. That was super helpful. Yeah, and and even like at the best of times, like, you know, I am glad my bank is checking to make sure I'm who I say I am. So I think a lot of it is really just saying like, hey, because I think that tends to happen, at least in my experience, when I when I'm especially as I'm working to get all my paperwork everywhere, wherever my name is changed, you know, people will be like, hey, I think someone's trying to commit fraud or get into my account or this person is being dishonest. Um, so just wanting to be like, no, definitely not trying to do that. Just trying to, you know, also you know, like you said, yeah, be who I am. Yes. Um, when, uh, when I first started at the Department of Insurance, um, I, it was my first state manager job. And the very first thing that was on my list was to hire, um, uh, hire a couple of staff. Um, and um, um, uh, I, identifying as gender nonconforming and also like I used to work for the Transgender Law Center. Like I was like, waiting for there to be problems with things like people submitting their um, uh, 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 their um, their college transcripts in in their dead name um, and then like being called back and being their dead name being used and da, 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 da. like I, I was like poised for that when I was um, uh, uh, when I started so I had a conversation with with HR about it and to my utter delight, I, I, they're like, oh yeah, no, no, we, we, we deal with that often, and, um, and we've been trained on that, and we know, and we appreciate you asking us to make sure that we're, you know, gonna have, you know, that we're that we've created a welcoming environment. That's not to say that that mistakes don't get made in the big bureaucracy, um, and it's not to say that there's not intentional mistakes that are, that are made. Um, 
uh, or it, 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 intentionality that's made. Uh, but my experience at the Department of Public Health has been one where folks have been really like um, uh, 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 wanting to make sure that we're a place that's uh, that's a welcoming workplace. So anyway, just wanted all to share my experience around that. So. So I can go ahead and share um, once you take the exam where to go to apply. Um, let me uh, say the, the first step is this ex ex exam process so that you can apply for specific classifications. And these classifications that we listed earlier were the ones that are most um, uh, uh, common at CDPH. And on the other side now, there are actual positions for specific jobs that you, you know, and now that you're on the list, you can apply for those specific, those specific jobs. Sometimes you can do the things simultaneously. So Preet, go for it. Thanks. All right. So what we want to do, so now that we've created the account and gone over the exam process and how to take the exam and where to find those, that then you will go back under um, the search button and you will actually go ahead and in the search now put the classification and unfortunately you have to spell the entire um, classification out. Uh, it doesn't take acronyms and it doesn't take words that don't match so it has to be the exact um, uh, classification. So in this case let's let's do health program specialist. And if we will go ahead and search that, and then it should pop up all of the health program specialist um, positions. And so in this case, you will see a lot of one positions. And then as you continue to scroll through, you will also see um, health program specialist two. Um, so you see that there's a lot of pages there. Another way that you can search for the positions is along with the classification, you can actually refine that um, search. So if you go all the way to the side, yep. And then you and since we're looking at Department of Public Health, you can go under the department um, and go ahead and put Department of Public Health. It's it's not California, it'll start with the D. Um, department of Public Health, there you go. And then you update your results. And once you do that, then go ahead and, and scroll down and you will see these are all the positions within Department of Public Health. Um, and then you basically start reading through them and you look at the job duties. So why don't we go ahead and click on the first one, just as an example. There you go. And so you'll see if you scroll down, well, let me go ahead and describe what's on the top. So generally these, these are um, just your template kind of all job postings are kind of set the same way. So at the top, you'll see the department, you'll see a JC number that's really for personnel, um, how we look at uh, the job control. Um, basically it's a number that we put for every posting. It'll give you the if there's a specified name um, or title to, to the position, that will be indicated here. Otherwise, it will just show the classification, which in this case is the health program specialist one. In this case, the working title is the local emergency preparedness coordinator, okay? And then I'll also give you the range for the salary and then the final filing date. Now that you've created an account, that apply now button, is where you're going to use that. And it will auto-populate that application that you just completed. Okay. Um, so when you do this, basically, it's going to ask you if you have eligibility. It's basically um, making sure that, you know, you're in the right place. Um, and most, most of you who have taken the exam will be on an eligibility list. Okay. And that's why we indicated last time is that if you don't take the exam and you're not on that list, you're not eligible for the position. So you will get um, basically disqualified as you continue through the process. So in this case, since you've already taken the exam, you're already in the process, you are 
eligible. Now, if your results come back for some reason that you did not pass, then you're not, and you want to make sure that you retake the exam. In most cases, it's um, six months, if not a full year, um, but you have to wait. So, so that's where that's going to go. Um, but if we can go ahead and click back. So on the job posting under job descriptions and duties, that's just the general sense of what the duties are for this position. Now, for more detailed information, um, it says additional information for this job in the duty statement. So right up, um, there you go. When you click on that, it will take you to the actual duty statement. And then you'll go ahead and open it. You can even save this. Um, and this will actually tell you more details about what the position holds. Um, see all of that. So in this case, you know, it explains all the different percentages of how much of that work that you will be participating in. And the rest after you scroll down. So once you see the duty statement, then you can scroll down. The minimum requirements, that's really um, just kind of template in, in every application, in every um, uh, submission you do need your job application packet um, with the duty statement. Um, uh, which you have. So, so what's in here is going to be, you know, your, your checklist. So when you go ahead and submit that application at the end, it will actually check to make sure that you have everything. If anything's missing, it's not going to let you submit. And it'll come up on red and say, oh, such and such documents are missing. In most cases, um, if they're asking for a resume and you forget to upload the resume, it will just, it, it won't let you submit and it will just put in red letters saying, oh, we still need your resume. Okay. Um, and as we scroll down, I'll let you know, um, I'll show you where it is. So this is your basic department information and then any right there. Uh -huh. And this is repeat of that information, special requirements, if there are any. And again, a lot of this is um, templated verbiage here. So you, you'll see a lot of this in, this, in job postings across. Um, this is just um, standard, standard words. Application instructions, and this you want to pay attention to only because in this, all of this is standard information right here. But as you scroll down, here is where what's required in the package documents. Now, in this case, there are statement of qualifications. You obviously have to have your application. Um, in this case, a resume is required and must be included. There's going to be other postings that it just says resume is optional. Okay, but in this in this posting, it is, it is required and it must be included in your package. Um, and then there's also a statement of qualifications. Now, with the statement of qualifications, it will give you a little bit more information of what that is and, and what it takes to complete that. So in here, it says um, there are instructions below at the end of this posting. So we'll go ahead and scroll down. Here are some desired qualifications. I would say pay attention to these as well. There might be some areas that you can really glean on from the information and really focus on it for your statement of qualifications. Okay. And um, so the, those desired means you might be up um, compar comparable to other candidates. This may put you over the edge to for the position. Okay. And then your benefits are, the, that's all standard language there. Your contact information, you'll always have a contact whether it's the hiring manager or the personnel liaison. So the, that's where your contact information is. And then as you scroll down, you see the statement of qualifications. That's where the details are. In this case, um, using the job duty statement and job description, please describe your knowledge, skills, experience um, for this position. It doesn't have anything else. Can you scroll down a little bit? Sometimes, sometimes it will actually specify how long it should be. In this case, it doesn't. Um, in, in many cases, it will say no more than two pages. Use, for example, Arial font, um, size 12 and no less. Um, so it, in some cases, it will actually give you more of a description. And here, it's pretty much open, right? But I would still suggest that don't make it more than two pages. It's um, just like your resume. You don't want to be, you know, five pages down to a resume. So uh, make things very concise. Um, they they will also, when they score statement of qualifications, just so that you know, a lot of times the scoring will be how well do you write? 
So there's a lot of emphasis on how do you communicate through writing? Okay. Are you, be, are you able to give concise information straight to the point? So pay attention to how you're writing um, when it comes to, obviously, um, uh, grammar, um, any, anything that you want to make sure, have people proofread it for you. Um, because sometimes writing about yourself, we tend to look over and glaze over words. So, um, you know, share it with somebody who you, you have confidence that can give you um, true feedback. Um, so that's basically your application process. So once you've gone through that, if you'll go ahead and scroll back up. And if you're good with everything, you're going to go ahead and hit that apply button and then everything's auto and you're going to upload um, your, in this case, your resume um, and your statement of qualifications. Always check your application. So once once um, it uploads and auto populates everything, make sure you go through each one of the steps anyway to make sure that it um, has all the information nothing got cut off and things like that okay or you might have some added things that you thought about oh you know what for this position now that i read the description there is something that i do want to put here because i did have this experience and i didn't actually include it in the original application when i first created the account so this is also your opportunity to go ahead and put more information if you need to if you need to add on and once you finish your application, say for this position, you can actually save it as a template. Um, or you can just save it as with the title and you know what to refer to. Okay. So then if you go into your account, um, you will see um, on, on the left bar, it will say templates. Um, and so under templates, you'll see this one. Say if you submitted your application for this, one of the templates will be for this position. There's also on the left-hand bar, um, you know, job, um, application submitted. So you can actually click there as well. But if you save it as a template, that will be your latest and most updated version too that you can use um, anytime. Um, so sometimes, you know, as you change positions, say you take on the HPS one and a year later you promote it and have another position, you may want to go ahead and either update your original template in your in your account, or you may want to just go back to this one and say, oh, I'm going to go ahead and just add on to this one because that way I don't have to retype everything. Okay, just different options. You'll get more familiar with that. You can play around with what works in your account. You can also in your account, you can actually upload your resume, um, and all your different statement of qualifications and just keep everything there so that you have a full file. So anytime that you're applying, you can actually pull your resume from there and upload it there. Just make sure that everything is kept current though. Okay, but that's, that's really the process. So if you haven't created an account, create your account, then go into the exams. Don't apply for positions without taking the exams because you'll get disqualified. So take your exams first. Um, in most cases, you can actually make a copy of your exams, read through everything, you can even answer your questions, and then go back and log in. It saves you time. For those of us who don't like to stare at the screen for, for a while, printing or looking at um, the, the exam off and then going back on helps help some of the anxiety too when you're taking an exam. Um, but remember these exams are not, you know, your calculus and things like that. They're more straight, more about your training, more about your experience and, and what you got to bring to, to the positions. Um, and then once you've taken the exam and you've gotten confirmation, then you go back and you go ahead and do a, a job search. And this is where you're going to get this application. And then all you have to do is apply now and it's auto-populated. Um, Really, that's how you navigate through that. And there's, you know, some exceptions and things like that that happen. If you ever need any additional help, you can always reach out to any of your um, HR personnel liaisons or feel free to reach back out to me. I'd be more than happy to help anytime I can. So maybe, so we do have some panelists uh, here. Maybe before we get to that, I know, uh, Jason, there was a question that we wanted to ask you kind of around health benefits, especially for um, trans folks, folks living with HIV, uh, disabled folks, kind of, 
is there gender affirming care included in the benefits package with the state? Um, and kind of what other expectations can we have with a job with the state? Well, let me start with like the with the benefits portion of, of this. Now, sometimes, depending on the classification that you apply for, mostly most of the time you'll be in, in, in one union. But if like you're a research scientist, you may be in another union and they have a little bit different of a benefit structure. Um, uh, uh, but um, for the vast majority, if actually for, for everyone who, who, who um, uh, uh, the folks who provide your retirements and your health care um, through the state is called CalPERS. Um, California ah, employee research. Uh, ah, anyway, it's the big CalPERS. Um, and um, since the early, uh, like 2012 or, or so, 2013, um, all benefits include gender affirming care. Um, now, that, uh, that said, we all know that that can be, a, you know, getting getting insurance coverage can be can be a journey um, with, in, you know, with insurers, whether you're public or private sector, but explicitly CalPERS um, uh, made sure that all of the um, the plans that are available and you have you have a choice um, uh, 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 provide the similar level of of, of gender affirming care. Um, also, that said, just as a side note, any plan sold in California is required to do so, whether you're in the public or private sector. Doesn't always make it easy to access it, but just FYI, comes from working for a decade at the Department of Insurance. So, um, uh, so um, and, um, and that includes, you know, coverage for PrEP and PEP and HIV care, um, and, um, and the benefits also include, you know, include retirement. Um, uh, pension and so um, anything else specifically Lexi I believe those were the big ones that uh, we had questions about and I know our panelists have experience also because some of our panelists work for the state office of AIDS and, and work specifically on prep, uh, 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 programs and so they might they might have something to say about that too um, when we start the panel so Danny, did, did you have anything you wanted to ask before we? Uh, no, I'm good. Great. Great, awesome. Thank you so much, Lexi, for facilitating that amazing discussion with Preet on the entire process. And it's really exciting to see so many folks already looking up like employment opportunities, asking questions about the test, you know, just really this engagement. Um, and of course, website maintenance decides to happen when we're having a webinar about how to get employed by CDPH. Um, definitely works that way, <laughs> evidently. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and introduce our panelists um, and allow them, you know, to say uh, who they are, their pronouns and, uh, what departments um, they work in um, as well. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pass it over to folks um, to introduce themselves. Everyone knows Jason, Jason's been on the line now uh, for about a good hour. Um, and then we see him in uh, many town halls and webinars. So um, I feel like Jason's just been a, a really big figure in our community. Um, but uh, Alejandro, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alejandro. I go by Ale. My pronouns are he and they. Um, I work for the California Department of Public Health in the Office of AIDS within the ADAP branch. ADAP stands for the AIDS Drug Assistance Program, which provides um, resources for those living with HIV uh, with medication and her insurance coverage. But I specifically am the unit chief for the Strategic Development Unit, which houses the PrEP app program, which provides um, a subsidy support for folks seeking uh, PrEP and PEP services across the state um, and other um, kind of grant management um, through um, the ADAP program. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, Tiffany, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Tiffany Woods. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am the state transgender health manager 
in the Office of AIDS along with Ale, my coworker. I'm in the prevention branch in the sexual health and program resilience section. I said it right this time, LA. <laughs> I know, I finally got it. I'm gonna get a t-shirt made with it. Um, uh, it's a newer unit. Um, so yeah, um, my role is a uh, state transfer health manager. I'm a, I'm a health program specialist too um, in May. And I am the first state transgender health manager in the California Department of Public Health. The position was actually created for me after coming, being the, the trans health, the first trans health specialist. So I not only work with OA, but I work across the CDPH, which is over like four, we have what, 4,000 plus employees and some multiple departments. And so I work on all trans related. My job description is literally to uh, do trans education, training, work with management to find out where needs are, gaps are, um, working internally for our diversity and inclusion. And uh, one of my core duties is I am one of the co-chairs of the California, the state, state co-chairs for the California HIV planning group, our statewide planning body, similar to our uh, local county planning bodies. And I'm also the first trans state uh, co-chair, so. I wear many different hats within OA and LA and I worked together and we implemented the very first ever internal Office of AIDS trans um, humility and responsiveness training um, that has never been attempted. So we created the training and have implemented it as an annual training now for all Office of AIDS uh, staff. So that's me. That is amazing. Thank you so much for all of your hard work. You're welcome. Happy um, to be here. Yes, thank you for being here. I'm excited. Um, Parks, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, I would have to follow Tiffany, um, but you know, it's great. I'm so grateful to work with you. Um, I'm Parks here. Uh, out in community, I use both she and they pronouns. In the workplace, I use they, them. Um, and part of that is A, if you got the privilege to be a little belligerent about it, I'm gonna be a little bit of belligerent about it. Um, and also it's important to me to like, make sure that people see me and that they're paying attention. So just so y'all know, since we're community, um, will not be insulted or like they see me in a space and someone uses she, her, if they're not mispronouncing me, everything's cool, but it's community. Um, I am the STD clinical services coordinator at the, for the STD control branch. Um, what do I work on? I work on many things. Uh, that I think the kind of two main grants I work on and the main things that I focus on are providing technical assistance, which is this like very vague umbrella term that they use at the state a lot, which involves things like helping people make sure that, you know, their budgets are aligned with what the grants say, yes, you can move forward with. Um, and, you know, folks have questions about, you know, the best practices or processes for like syphilis testing, or, you know, how other counties are administering um, monkeypox treatment then I'm part of the work that kind of just helps to bring folks together and get people resources. Um, goodness, was there another icebreaker, like anything we were supposed to add to it? Uh, my background is in uh, sexual and gender minority healthcare. I am a researcher and program management um, background, and I come from a direct service background um, into the state, which my guess is that many folks here um, have also kind of come to health work through personal uh, pathways. So we'll discuss that more later. Um, yeah, so glad y'all are here. So nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Um, Jude, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, Wanda, hello, hi. I'm Jude Ballman, he, him. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm also with the California Department of Public Health. Uh, my program is housed in the Occupational Health Branch and it's the California Safe Cosmetics Program. I'm the I'm a policy analyst by training, and I wear a lot of different um, hats in my program, but I'm running communications is my main title. And uh, we are uh, regulating the cosmetics industry a little bit and doing a lot of education about hazardous ingredients in cosmetics and how to avoid exposure to them. So yeah, my whole background has been in environmental justice, and I also come from an activist background and came here through a very wiggly path, but maybe we'll talk about it. Yeah, that's me. 
That's awesome. I didn't even know that branch existed, so I'm learning something new. <laughs> Um, and then last but certainly not least, uh, Carrie, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks so much, Danny. Uh, my name is Carrie Escovito. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I am a regional capacity building coordinator uh, at the STV control branch, uh, like parks. Um, I engage with local health jurisdictions in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, pertaining to sexually transmitted infections and hepatitis C uh, as they relate to state administered grants. Um, I am a UCSF contract worker, project policy analyst three is my position title. Um, outside of work or my background, I, I do harm reduction related work. Um, I have done so in the Bay Area for almost 10 years, and I engage uh, in nightlife uh, in San Francisco specifically um, for overdose prevention and um, other harm reduction topics. Awesome, thank you. And thank you all so much for taking time, especially after work hours to sit on this panel. We really do appreciate it. And I'm just really excited for our community to have this opportunity to learn about not only the work that you do, but what's it like working in CDPH, you know, as members of the LGBTQ community and such. So um, I really want to let everyone know, like, I will be asking the panel questions um, just to kind of get everyone kickstarted. But if you have any specific questions for the panel, please feel free to raise your hand or put it in a chat box. And we're more than happy to call on you um, or to read your question out, out loud. But this is the perfect opportunity for everyone, you know, to really learn like, what's it like to work at CDPH? You know, what are some of the challenges and barriers? You know, um, all of the things. So um, yeah, feel free to ask questions. So um, I'm going to kick it off um, with, um, hopefully it's a softball question. Um, which is, uh, what's it like working at CDPH, you know, as an LGBTQ person? Sure, I'll kick us off since we're sitting in silence. Um, hi, <laughs> um, I have been working for CDPH for two years now. My, my anniversary is next month, um, and I have had a really fantastic experience. Um, I, I think Office of AIDS specifically is really um, uh, forward and really on top of stuff. Obviously we're working with a population that has been uh, historically queer um, and um, uh, down with the movement. And so a lot of my coworkers, a lot of my peers um, and um, just really get our community are really passionate about the work um and i myself when i applied um uh you know when i did the whole like a, a, a st statement of qualifications and all that stuff i um there were questions specifically that asked about my experience working with hiv or about my community and when i read that i was like oh this is a, a place for me to actually be authentic and talk about myself and talk about my community work and my advocacy. And um, that was a really strong selling point for me. And then the people that interviewed me really like asked me questions about who I was and, and I was able to tell like my lived experience in those interviews and I was able to, you know, get the job. Right. And so, um, and because of that, you know, in, in the last two years, I went from being a health program specialist and now I'm a unit chief in the span of two years, and that's really freaking cool. Um, and so um, it just really, I was able to be authentic and it's been just a really awesome experience to be honest. So um, uh, I have nothing but good things to say. I'll follow since Alay and I work together um, at the Office of AIDS. So um, <laughs> I just, I came from this, from activist background in the community. Um, I know many of these attending here. Um, 16 years as a program manager uh, running and creating trans programming in at an FQHC in Alameda County, a federally qualified health center. So when I applied, I've been out, everybody knew I'm trans, I'm out, I was a trans program manager. Um, 
And I specifically applied to the position of the first transgender health specialist at Offstage. So I kind of knew I was going to be walking in a new territory as a out trans woman. And I think I a, wasn't sure what to do. Um, they had a, uh, a tr uh, the first trans person was a young intern, um, non-binary, uh, trans masculine. And then I came in as a, the first trans woman that was hired. So there was some growth on their end. Um, I, for me, just I just walk in and like, okay, I'm here. So, um, the, I think the interview process is a little there. I think they weren't even sure what, like, should we have trans specific questions? Um, there had already been a lot of um, what we'd say gay, gay male staff um, employed throughout the years and in leadership. So that was a learning process for them um, more than anything. And I, came, I literally was hired on Transgender Day of Remembrance 2020, um, in 2018, and they weren't even aware of it. Like that was my first day. Like, oh, we do anything for Transgender Day of Remembrance today. And they were like, what? Like we can barely get any World AIDS Day on our website acknowledgement. So. It was much more of a conservative environment. Um, and I think that just being yourself and being authentic um, is what changes internally. Um, in turn, it, it, because you just you just be yourself and you be authentic. People, they were worried that people were gonna ask me about the bathroom question and da da da. And it's actually one of my interview questions was, what if somebody asked you about the bathroom? And I'm like, Oh, well, you mean what bathroom do I use? And do I like, you know, and I just basically took over the question for them, right? Like, don't worry about that. Um, because we've had CD page historically has have been kind of conservative, especially public leaning and internally. So um, I will say that Elaine and I and um, our, my STD control colleagues here, who we've been integrating and we work like hand in hand together, have been really pushing boundaries. Um, we've had new leadership. Um, and all of that, our work and just our presence and our being ourselves and authentic have really led to a lot of internal changes for, for where we're at today and even to have this panel. I mean, literally in June, we were all on a, the very first ever CDPH Pride event in June of 2022. So just think about that. Um, so this is just really another moving step forward um, to increase the diversity of and our gender diverse workforce. And we are all really excited to be able to um, to to bring ourselves to work and, and be able to do the work that we do. Um, it's an, it's always a challenge to be yourself in, in any work environment, but and I think working remote has definitely enhanced our environment and our ability to be present. So I I get it. Every 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 experience is unique. I have not had any present any any issues. I think mine was more. It takes about a year, and people will tell you it takes about a year to get acclimated to state service and learning all the bureaucracy and Jason can attest, like there's a lot of two years. Yeah, I'm thinking two years, um, learning the ins and outs bureaucracy and the things that you can and cannot do. And I think it's a little bit more difficult from an activist background, if you, for community activism that many of us bring to be able to say, oh, you can't do that. And oh, nope, can't send that out. Or oh, nope, you know, that's, your emails are public and they could be, you know, subpoenaed or those are the adjustments. So I have my other hat. I'm the uh, outside of state service. I am the California Democratic Party LGBT caucus co-chair for Northern California. So I can do the things that I used to do and do activism and political work. And I don't have to bring that to work. It's just keeping those hats separate. And I, and that's what I think is, is if you go into state service, you need those other community outlets to do the work that where you're not dealing with the bureaucracy. So that's some advice and I will stop there. Thank you, Tiffany. That was perfect. Um, I wanna second the separation. Um, and that's actually one of the things that I really like about my job. So um, as someone who used to do a lot of direct service work with queer youth experiencing homelessness um, and helping with medical navigation, um, I burnt out. Like, I'm just gonna be completely honest about that. Like working with my own community is one of the greatest blessings like that I have in my life. And it also is one of the most exhausting things. Um, and, you know, you, you can, yeah. Anyway, so like one of the nice things about working with CDPH um, is that I get to leave work at the end of the day. 
right? Like I get to turn off my computer. I get to leave work. Um, I think one of my coworkers said like, no one's going to die if you don't send an, e if, you, if you don't send that email about gonorrhea at 6 30 PM, right? Like it's going to be fine. Right. Like, um, and I know from like doing like more direct service roles that like sometimes it literally was about somebody like getting access to housing um, or medication if I like didn't work that overtime and um, that is just something that um, wasn't sustainable for me. Um, so one of the nice things about working with CDPH is that I do have immense support for work-life balance. Um, I make a living wage in the Bay Area. Um, so to name numbers, I think that's really important. Um, I'm contractual through UCSF, and right now I make about $80,000 a year um, and have really good health benefits. Um, so that, again, like I'm not making tech money, but I also don't work in tech. Um, so that's kind of cool. And um, I have resources to take care of myself, which is great. Um, and then I do volunteer work on the side. So I still volunteer working with queer youth, um, but it is something I put five hours into, you know, not 60 anymore. Um, so that has been an uh, immense thing to have the resources now personally to then pour into my community through a volunteer role. Um, other things, what it's like working at CDPH. Um, I will say, I think it's really department dependent. I like want to name that there's a lot of folks here representing from the STD control branch and office of AIDS. Um, to branches that approach infectious disease from a um, historically nece necessitated, necessitated queer perspective, right? And like liberation perspective. And so I think that a lot of us, um, there are a lot of queers in the departments and the branches um, that we work in. And um, I'm really lucky that um, I have an amazing supervisor who is also like plugging a job opening that we're about to post in the chat, um, Eric Tang, who is um, incredibly supportive and uh, kind. And um, I know when I was approaching, like when I was going through the application process, I absolutely, um, you know, had to send the name email, right? <laughs> had to be like, hey, um, and was, uh, has been very helpful and supportive throughout this whole process. Um, other things is that, you know, it's still a workplace, right? And I think that's something that's important, right? Even when you work with community, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone's going to get your pronouns right. It doesn't mean that they're not going to, you know, make mistakes. But I will say that, like, my colleagues have been really receptive to when mistakes have happened. Like, for example, in a team building exercise, someone was like, let's submit photos, like baby photos. And I like emailed them being like, hey guys, like not gonna be what not trying to be a wet, wet blanket here, but like this is actually maybe not the best icebreaker as far as being gender supportive, because it can really out folks, um, as well as like not everyone has photos of them from childhood, wants to share them. Like there are lots of reasons that's just like maybe isn't it. Let's talk about like favorite foods or something. I don't know. Um, and they're really receptive and like we're not gonna do that icebreaker again. And so that's really cool. Um yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop there. Um, well, if if we're if we're still good with this question, I can add on a little bit too. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, so I've been with the state for ten years, and I slowly got more gay, and more trans as that as those years went by, more visibly so, you know. And so the first year I was here, I was with a less conservative department. And I definitely did not feel comfortable doing that process there. At CDPH, there is a lot of queer people, I agree. And I'm in a different, I'm not in the um, STI branch or Office of AIDS, um, but there's still a lot of queer people. There's not a lot of trans people. So that part was definitely felt like a bit of a throw the dice and see what happens to do that in a, in a job, you know? But um, I have to say, the systems were were there. They were ready to change my name everywhere without it even being like a, a legal name change yet. Nobody batted an eye about it. And um, socially, everybody was very eager to support that, even if they didn't know how. So there was a lot of hiccups, you know, where people would, you know, just say something weird or um, use some maybe outdated language or something like that. But for the most part, um, Felt okay. And it's also been particularly nice to be working remotely. It's been a great way to <laughs> deepen 
uh, visible transition. So I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of people that's been true for. But yeah, overall, yeah, CDPH, particularly Richmond, great place to be queer as far as a government organization, I think. You just, I just have to say, you have just a huge smile on your face, Jude. I love it. <laughs> I always I, do. I, I can't feel help your, it. I can feel your <laughs> yeah. I love that. And we need more now. Um, just to be mindful of time, I'll try and keep mine brief. Uh, but my experience being, so I've worked at uh, the SC control branch at CDPH for about a year and a half. Um, I do come uh, from a direct service background um, and from the community as well. Uh, you might hear my dog bark uh, right now, but um, basically, you know, something that I have learned about working um, in the system is that uh, people tend to uh, take each other at face value, meaning that um, I don't find that um, questions that may be considered invasive tend to be the norm. Uh, that's just my personal experience as a cisgender person. I don't, you know, I can't speak for somebody else with a different gender experience, but. Um, I do also find with that said, uh, you know, it's interesting to be uh, participating in uh, conversations objectively when they, uh, the conversation topics pertain to your demographic. Um, for example, you know, I'm a gay man, a sexually active adult. Um, I'm a person of color. Um, and so these things, certain topics just feel very, direct to me, you know, I'm also very uh, linked with my local HIV uh, community. So um, it's, it's just, yeah, see, um, but all that's just to say is that, you know, it's, it's, it can be challenging to divorce this idea that you are a real person versus a statistic or like a, um, you like, you know, People of color who use drugs or who um, have engaged in sex practices that are not, you know, that may, you know, like there's a lot of like ways that you can feel like if you're sitting in a room and you feel like people are talking about you and not, um, uh, you know, you're, you're not, uh, it's, it's, it's just, a re people need to be reminded that they're talking about real people. They're not talking about something that's theoretical. They're not talking about something that exists on paper, right? That people of color, that queer people of color, sex, sex workers, transgender people, all of these people are real people who could be in the room. And I have found in my experience in public health before I started working at the branch uh, to be reflective of like um, to having that attitude where these are more theoretical uh, representatives rather than real people. Fortunately, I have a lot of queer colleagues and we're able to um, <laughs> represent ourselves, you know, truly, I feel like comfortable in, in expressing myself or, um, in a true way, but um, I also am okay with um, being neutral. I work with public health departments who, you know, I don't know what their opinions are about queer people, um, but I do have the added perspective that, you know, if I'm a queer person living in, you know, some county somewhere that isn't offering adequate sexual health services for their queer population, what would my experience be? And I can relay that to the representative that I'm speaking to directly. And that's something that I consider to be an advantage in my particular um, avenue of my work. Thank you so much. And thank you all for your experiences. Um, Jason, I think you wanted to say something or go next. Yeah, just just real, really quickly. Um, uh, as as a manager, um, we have to go through. I think I think the first set is like eighty hours of of manage, management training. Um, a lot of which is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and first of all, I was I was um, again pleasantly surprised at the um, at how well. Um, they approached issues around gender and sexual orientation in their in 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 the training materials and and ongoing, um, and um, so that that's the that's the first piece. Um, uh, and the other thing I, the other thing I want to say is is, and I don't want to 
toot OHE's own horn, but with the Office of Health Equities, with the creation of this, specifically this gender health equity section, our job is not just to look at this from how are we doing programming outside, but how do we make this a place where people can bring their entire selves to work. And so we have like dedicated resources to actually do that. They're slim right now, but that's why we're hiring people. But, uh, but dedicated resources to actually do that. And, um, and I really appreciated um, those who talked about um, uh, the challenge of working on issues that are related to their own oppression. Um, and and I'll just I'll just say like as a manager, um, that was that was one of the first things that I talked with my new staff about. It's like you're going to be working on these issues that are personal to you, and we need to make sure that you have you know you have breaks, you have space. If something is something you can't work on for a specific reason, let's talk about it and figure it out. Um, uh, because again, like we want people to be, I mean, people need to be treated as people. And all too often, we all know like, like queer people are, uh, feel super tokenized in the workplace. And we, we get asked questions about, uh, about our identity as we, as like, we have to represent the pressure of having to represent every single um, LGBTQ person uh, 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 in the department. And so really trying to like, look at that through a different lens and help other Offices and department uh, offices in our department look at that through a different lens. Thank you so much, Jason, for sharing that, and really thank you, panelists, for you know just sharing your personal experiences. You know that it takes a lot to open up and be honest and real with everyone. So I really do appreciate that. And Ale, I appreciate you in the chat box and everyone else. You know, answering and engaging with folks. Um, as they're posing their questions or seeking assistance because they want to apply right now and identify like, what tests do I need to take? Um, so I'm really thankful for everyone's engagement uh, this evening. Um, it looks like we have a question from Malo. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thank you, Danny and the panelists. I really appreciate uh, the candor and the vulnerability. Um, I think when a lot of folks look at you all as these superheroes, you know, going into community, helping us out. Uh, but like Park said, you know, it can be exhausting. Um, so I do appreciate, you know, the honesty. Um, my question was, um, and Tiffany, you sort of touched on this. Um, how many of you in your positions, and probably Jason, you would be more poised to respond to this, have the ability to influence uh, the type of contracting that happens in your functional area for LGBTQ like vendors or independent contractors? Anyone want to touch that first? What? What what you what you uh, it, that's a really great question. I really really appreciate you you asking it. Um, I, I will just start off by saying the um, procurement process for that uh, for, for for contracts is really complicated and very slow. Um, the the you know the 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 barriers that are up that are 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 challenging, and I I will just say that when for as as uh, as a as a, a, a section manager, um, you know we we have to be we have to be really careful. Um, uh, 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 it is illegal to say I'm giving you a contract because of your gender or because of your sexual orientation. Um, um, however, it is perfectly um, reasonable to say we need people who can come in um, and bring experience working with communities. Um, and, uh, and, and that goes for contracting and, and, and staffing too. And so, um, you know, we have, uh, I mentioned earlier on, we have, uh, you know, the, the department has a commitment um, uh, to ensuring that our, our, our 
workforce rep, uh, it looks like the rest of California. Um, and uh, we are we are embarking upon a huge change process in in the CDPH, um, where we have we, we we have the ears of of people. Some stuff is really difficult and and, and challenging to work through, and, and requires like changes in laws and changes like at other departments like Cal HR or. The Department of General Services, who deals with all our contracting, and everything. Um, but um, but we're pushing and uh, and 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 doing what we doing what we can. For it. Yeah. Anyone else? I, I just want to echo what Jason. Managers deal when you're at the staff services one, two, three, whatever that level. Managers unit deal with a lot more different things, and they really interface with HR and and that kind of level of bureaucracy and management. So I'm a manager position, but I don't have staff supervision. I don't supervise. LA has a unit that he supervises. Um, and LA was with me in prevention. So um, so I'm lucky that I, and I, I don't want to supervise staff. I, I was a manager for years managing trans staff. I had a full, like I supervised seven trans. Um, we didn't have any non-binary staff. I had a few interns, but all trans staff trans women, young, black, let's Latinx, trans um, staff that um, was amazing and awesome, but I'm older now, I'm 59 and um, I like to come to work now and not have to figure out who, who, what happened to your weekend and drop two hours of my morning time when I need to get to report to, you know, basic counsel, like what happened over the weekend? Who got arrested? Who got into it with so and so? You know, community stuff. So um, I, I've done that. I don't want to supervise anybody. Um, I want to be able to focus on the work. Um, and so I love the management. I let them do it, and I I can influence things with my position. Um, example. So I said earlier, I um, I was hired on Transgender Day of Remembrance 2018, and there was like they were like what, and yet. What Tuesday on the or second yesterday on the second I sent it out on all CDPH staff, which is almost 200 employees, a transgender awareness month email, with links and resources and hey we're going to be recognizing this this month and TDA we're going to be recognizing transgender remembrance on the 20, that's a huge change and I've been able to do that the last couple of years and LA will send out things, you know we will send out constant emails. We send out emails for uh, National Pronoun Day, National Non-Binary Awareness Day, and we we influence culture change internally by doing things like that that have never done before. And when we get personal emails back saying thank you so much for this, I really appreciate this. Um, the resources are great. We know that we're making a difference um, by just showing up the way we can at work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's we we all have different collective ways of and of of moving the the change and the progress forward. So I'll drop. I, I don't know if I answered the question, but <laughs> hopefully I did. Well, all right. Thank you so much. I appreciate that and the honesty. Um. So. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask uh, another question. Um, so um, what type of training does CDPH staff and management undergo to ensure LGBTQ staff feels safe and affirmed in their identity? Oh, this is, I can take this one. I think, um, uh, you know, Tiffany and I obviously worked hard to establish this training within Office of AIDS and uh, the Office of Health Equity obviously is doing a ton of work around this to really go across CDPH to have um, uh, cultural sensitivity trainings, um, have training within units. Me as a manager, I just went through like this 80 hour required training around so many different topics. And one of those topics was obviously um, LGBT focused. And um, I think I was maybe one of a hand, maybe one of two or three other like queer people in this like 40% group. Um, 
but management is having to go through these trainings and, um, you know, we're obviously influencing, you know, directors and stuff like that, that, you know, this has to happen and not everybody kind of gets it. Not everybody is often like invested, but um, the fact that like leadership is leadership has buy-in to this and they're respecting it and they, they're making others, they're, they're doing these trainings like, Hey, why don't we have our pronouns on our name tags, little things? Why don't we have, um, you know, our, our, you know, our names of choice on our name tags. Why don't we have um, these little things? So we're, we're, our managers and our directors are noticing things through these trainings and we're having discussions as coworkers and staff and little small groups or breakouts in these Zoom rooms. And, and we're asking ourselves what policy changes can happen? Uh, uh, what, how can we change the culture in our workplace to have uh, you know, our community feel safe and accepted? And then our leadership is there taking these notes and doing something about it. And you know, it might not happen overnight, but they're hearing us and they're taking the notes and they're doing something. Uh, Danny had to step away and I guess Ali was the only one that was gonna answer that. Um, uh, how does CDPH handle individual gender expression, such as like gender bending, leather wear, fun hair colors, piercings, tattoos, etc. Um, tattoos, right, Carrie? <laughs> yeah, just... well, um, I, as as the a panelist with a visible face tattoo, I can answer this one uh, first, <laughs> maybe. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so uh, yeah, here it is. It's my little bird but I also have things on my neck and on my arms. So something that I think is actually valuable, this is just my own personal perspective. And I know that other panelists may you know, come from different uh, tribes or backgrounds uh, pertaining to some of these things such as like leather and things like that. But as far as being like a, a tattooed person or a person with piercings and things like that, um, it can be tricky because at least for, for my role, uh, it's, it's contingent upon my ability to be neutral. And what I interpret that to mean is that, you know, I'm arriving to work in a fashion that is uh, not actually distracting to the point of it's taking away from the topic that's actually very serious or it's very, it's about real things. Like we're, we're discussing like grant budgets. We're talking about money. We're talking about people with sexual, um, you know, disseminated gonococcal infection. We're talking about syphilis, and you know, uh, being a community community member who is, uh, you know, I, I would consider myself to be heavily tattooed. Um, it's not something that has ever been brought up. I've never acknowledged it. I just pretend it's not there, um, and um, I, I do try to keep a business casual attire personally. But that's also just because my particular role um, is meeting with health jurisdiction representatives who I don't know what their opinions are about me. I don't know or what I do or what I represent, what my lifestyle is like. I actually had a, 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 a septum ring as well before I took the job. Um, I, I did remove it uh, because I figured a, a, a head tattoo was enough. I didn't really feel like I needed to add more to what was already there. So um, yeah, I don't know. So I'm I'm curious as to what other people's um, perspectives are. You know, there are some things that I I can't change, but there are some things that I do have the option to um, to not disclose. So I I take that at face value. Uh, yeah, I'm also pretty tatted. I have a pretty big invisible neck tattoo. Um, my previous manager also really heavily tatted and he's got like a big old one on his back he's you know um and um as far as the presentation um uh, uh you know uh, at least in an office of aids we're almost 100 percent remote work um and so coming into the office um or even how we present ourselves on on zoom uh we can be off camera if we do have to be on camera and present ourselves uh it's typically in a you know like carrie said in, in a professional setting where we're talking about really serious things um grants budgets things like that so i want to present myself that doesn't take away from the topic that we're talking about um and actually you know office of aids just had their very first in-person 
uh, all staff meeting this Monday and it was Halloween and apparently off as a Bates goes down for Halloween and you know everybody showed up in their Halloween outfits so it was pretty extra and I mean not you but it was pretty extra so seeing all of these people dressed up pretty silly um doing pretty much the most in wigs etc was really kind of an you know funny and light um and just speaks to the culture of I guess my workplace that we you know it, it just depends on the time and place and what you're doing. Um, but I think the remote work really helps with um, yeah. being able to present how I like, um, when I want, how I want. And then I don't have to really often worry about, oh gosh, I'm going into the office. What I, where do I, you know, do I present more fam? Do I present more mask? Um, you know, all those things. So it just really depends. Yeah, I think it really depends on what department and where you're working at, honestly. I mean, prior to remote, we were there every day and, um, you know, some folks who do the traditional, you know, professional thing and others who don't. And, you know, we, I remember back, it was so long, I feel like it was so long ago that we all got redirected to remote on March 17th, 2020. Um, but we had, we had folks with staff with multicolored, you know, different colored hair and dye. And I don't think any, nobody ever made anything about it. So, uh, and I just want to point out what Office of is not, has, like I say, I said earlier, traditionally were conservative. They were more, much more conservative about uh, like prevention materials going out that had two gay men, but showing, talking about anal sex, like that set got shut down and was then even, there's some notorious stories about how materials had been printed in thousand dollars and were never disseminated because somebody above us had like conservative and uh, complain to the director, you know, or uh, way above at the CDBH director. Um, so it, it's not always been this way. Um, I just want to make sure that that's clear. And, and getting anything that's public facing on a website and stuff does take definite some specific skill sets to get through um, because it's very scrutinized. If one person complains of something, they they will listen to them. And we do have, for example, harm reduction syringe exchange. We have several counties that are constantly um, looking to shut our syringe, our harm reduction unit down, um, in both in Northern California and Southern California. I won't name those counties, but they uh, they they will do anything to shut our services down, um, take us to court, um, subpoena all of our internal documents relating to the syringe services you know, directives in that county. Um, so we do are, are mindful of that. And I deal with the California planning group. And we have, you know, when we have our in-person meetings in Southern California or um, here in, in, in Northern California, anybody, the member public can show up and, you know, say something, it's open to the public. So we do have to be mindful of, of our public personas. And I facilitate a lot of statewide um, webinars and I'm redirected to monkeypox leading, co-leading with our office based director, um, our statewide uh, equity and stakeholder. So I take on a face of the office of AIDS a lot. So I'm always mindful, camera on. I, I you know, Lexi, you know, I, I this, you, you know, this is my life, right? I'm definitely the, the mom with the presented. I, I don't, um, I'm old school that way. So, um, but I'm cognizant of, of what we're projecting out there. Um, because I think we do take a level of, of, of responsibility in our job, and especially as LGBTQ plus staff that we, we do want to represent. Um, and we want to break down the barriers and push the doors open. None of us want to be the first and only. We really want to create the spaces and, and the culture change so that you all have opportunities to come in right behind us. And, and some of us are tired. We've been doing this a long time and um, we need you all to come in and take over, so. Yeah, I want to like just underline some of like the respectability politics that have been mentioned multiple times on this panel about things like, you know, you try to maintain neutrality, right? Like, or you do, right? And you like make a mindful decision to present that. You like um, acknowledge that you are public facing. You acknowledge that like, you know, there are certain things that might be read certain ways culturally. And I think that's something that I, I, I'm going to make an assumption and say that every single person here like knows what navigating that compromise looks like at times in their life. Um, and 
I feel really privileged to be in a position of um to be speaking on this panel right to like be in a position where like I am making that choice for myself to um you know, I guess in some ways like code switch, although I'm not sure if that's entirely the right word to use in this case, but um, yeah. And I think that that's a compromise that people need to figure out how much they're willing to make. And so like, I, although it is not, sorry, that's my dog being disgusting in the background because he's like 15 years old. Um, so sorry. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, I think that there are things that people, you're, I, I wouldn't come into, I mean, coming into any workplace and expecting everyone to like fully see and support and celebrate your authentic self. I have questions about how much like vulnerability you're bringing into your work, right? Like, because I think that that's just really hard for everyone to know. And, um, but I think that there are certain, I mean, I'll speak as like, so like I'm a leather dyke and like, that's a really important identity to my heart. Like that is super important. I'm out about it. Leather is on my resume. Um, but when I go to Folsom and Dory, I'm covered. Like I am fully ready. And part of this is also that I like continue to volunteer with youth, but it's like, if there's a photograph of me taken at this event and it ends up like being Googled or on a background check in the future, like I can be like, oh yeah, I'm a member of the leather community. It's on my resume. And you actually can't see my chest in that photograph. Like that's not something I have to explain. Um, which again is a complicated thing to explain and like complicated when I like go with partners, right. To like these events. I mean, like, hey, I'm actually not going to take photos with you. Um, but it's a part of it. And it also means that I am positioning myself to continue to work in the community in this these positions of public health. Because as Pike said in the chat, Pike, love you in the chat right now. I know, right? Even that. Ah, the best. Um, we love Pike. <laughs> and that, like, you know, you do make compromises in order to uh, get your foot in the door when it comes to things like interviews, et cetera. Um, but I will say like, so Rachel McLean, um, who's one of my like, like I wanna be in Rachel's pocket all the time and like listen to everything Rachel says because I'm like absolutely obsessed. Um, but Rachel told me, I think I'll make my second week here. Yeah, big fans of Rachel. Um, my second week here that like, you know, you're gonna work on a two page document for two years and it's gonna take for ever and you're not going to understand why it's getting gummed up in pipelines and uh people are going to go on leave and there's not going to be movement it's going to be really really exhausting and then it's going to pass through and you're going to impact millions of people and like what other job do you get to do that in and that is something that I go back to again and again and again when like I feel stuck I feel like all I've done is schedule meetings and like take notes and like um you know do go-betweens and maintenance um and I like remember that like these things take a lot of time but then I'm in a position to do that kind of work and I get to do it along people who have been in it way longer than I have who are like deeply committed who have such a like wealth of knowledge and history in the field of public health um and navigating it as a queer person trans person non-binary person um and that's really really special it's like super special. Um, so yeah, again, everyone gets to make their own decisions around like what compromises and what pathways they will take in their career and in their lives. Um, but I think that um, if you are interested in working in a government position, uh, it's going to take time. Like it's going to just be a grueling amount of time through the application process, through figuring out what the heck your job even is for the first year, um, to like, you know, working on documents that don't necessarily make it through or take too long, but it's worth it. I think the payout is really worth it. Um, yeah. It, it, oh my gosh, I just, I'm sorry, go ahead. Tiffany. I just wanna say, I love how she frames that, but know that you have support too. We, I would say just, you know, and I know Jude, you probably have your support system, but LA, Parks, Carrie, Jason, several, Eric, uh, Pike, who's in the chat. We all have worked together for the last few years and we are on sometimes Zooms just to us or teams and we hang on after the official business and just support each other. And we code switch when we need to code switch, right? And, and that's, that's, we need to do that for a few minutes, right? Um, and so you have a support system and I know we, this this group has been working on expanding our LGBTQ internal support. So we have some big moves that we're 
and long-term plans to do that. So I just wanted to, to, to lift that up because um, park, park is being, that's just real talk. Go ahead, Jason. Um, I was just say thank you, Parks, for saying that. And that was giving me a little tears here. It was very, that was very, um, it was very right on. Um, also, I'm just gonna brief, briefly mention um, uh, something. I know we're, we're getting toward the end of the call, um, uh, but I wanna put this out there too, um, as uh, uh, I, I come to this position with a good deal of privilege, um, I'm a manager. I started like uh, I I I've always I was dabbled with makeup, but I've never like like really done anything like at the workplace and everything. And work from home really kind of helped that. And then I had my first in person, you know, our first in person meeting for our office uh, yesterday and the day before. And like I, I was I was really torn because I was really. Uh, uh, worried. I knew that I wasn't going to be judged, but it was, you know, like, um, but it was, I, I, I had a great experience and also, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I had that great experience. The other thing that I will add is as a queer poly person who's polyamorous, um, the, the, that is still something that people are, are wrapping their brains around. Um, you know, when I say my partner this or my partner that, um, assuming that it's the same person, um, is 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 sometimes challenging. And these are like you know personal conversations I have with with folks. And so that the that part is is something that is is uh, people I think are, are still definitely getting used to when we choose to um, to share that that part of our of our uh, ourselves. So. Okay, can I just and, give some real concrete advice on filling out exams? Like for those who are I, I, looking at all the, so I just did the HPS appla application in December and blocked out like two hours and it took me a lot longer because it kept timing out. Okay, so so when you get to certain, like HPS is kind of like, uh, it's similar to staff services one where it's like strengths, like, you know, I strongly agree, I, you know, it, it's all your, what do you call it? Like strength-based, right? Jason, I would say strength-based questions, right? Yeah, like like how do you consider your ability to budget, you yeah. know, strongly, or I could teach it, or you know, da, da 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 da. First of all, don't worry about oh, I should miss a couple to make it look real. Answer, answer it all. <laughs> Just go go straight in and answer fives all the way. You're going to come up with a 96, and you'll be on the list for a year. But when you get to levels of exam like HPS2, where they do, it's, it's, it's like an essay question of your experiences. Okay, pull your experiences from your resumes, if you've ever done those, and put them in a separate Word document. Those essay questions are 200 words and they're not playing with you. They're not gonna let you go 201. You wanna go, you wanna go 999. So if you are, Oh, let me write all this stuff down, and then you go in, and then it won't move forward because then you're you're, you're trying to adjust it. Have all your words, all your kind of if you can get the preview of the exam. Sometimes they let you look at it uh, online. The exam, answer in a word document so that you can just cut and paste them in there. It saves you so much time, and you'll know you're exactly. Make sure they're 200 word count or not over 200. You know, go up as much experience as you can up to the one 199. I suggest if you can do 200 exactly, great. But it saves you a lot of time, and you can tweak your answer specifically to what they're asking you. So make sure, and then save it in a Word document because you'll need that when next time you apply for something, you just pull that document out. Whatever Google Docs, you young people, I'm old school, but have your document so that it saves you so much time because a lot of times they just repeat the same question. And they just phrase it differently. Um, and, and there are, once you get to certain levels, it is essay questions. So I just wanted to share that to save you some time. Um, to kind of roll off of what you just said, I, I, I just got into this manager position and, and I, in the first three months of my position, I lost a staff member. A staff member is going on maternity leave in December and I had to hire somebody brand new. And um, this was all new for me, right? So I, I had to hire somebody and I had to figure this out and I had to you know, look at applications. And I, I mean, if there's an SOQ for your job, 
that you're applying for, a statement of qualifications, make sure it's specific to the job that you're looking for. And if there, if you're looking, look at the duty statement. There's a duty statement for each job. That duty statement has specific terminology and words and, and jargon. And you want to have that in your statement of qualifications and you wanna have that terminology and jargon in your resume and things like that. Because yeah. when I was reading applications and I was reviewing things and I was reading statement of qualifications, I was, I was key searching, keyword searching for things that were relevant to the job. Specifically, if, if you know, obviously, I'm, I'm, I was hiring for a prep um, advisor. I was looking for the words prep. I was looking for HIV. I was looking for navigation. I was looking for those things. And if you didn't have that experience or you know weren't you know involved or advocacy or things like that, I wanted somebody in that position that had something to say about that. And some some of these applications were so general. You were an analyst. You did some you know this. You did that. And I was like, okay, that's that's cool. You you might interview well. I was looking for somebody that was that read the that read the duty statement that read the application that uh, really resonated with the position because I wanted somebody that was gonna not only know what they were doing and know what prep was know what HIV was know how to work with that community was but like really know you know really grow the position and really have some vision and so just really honestly look at the duty statement and and write them specifically to each job and that might be tweaking a couple words here and there um, and you know. Uh, it's the, the 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 unit manager or section manager really is the person establishing the criteria for what they're looking for, and that was that that was a privilege for me. I was like, I've never gotten to establish this is what specifically I'm. So once you take your test and it goes through HR and they choose whoever's chosen that meets the qualifications, the the chosen applications get sent to the hiring manager. That's the person, and so then we get to look at X amount of applications. It could be three, it could be 14, it could be five. Whichever ones met those qualifications, we get to interview them and we have to interview them um, if they meet our qualifications that we established for ourselves. So just make sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're putting some relevant information there. You're not making it general and that you're, you're speaking to the job that you're looking for. And I got this person hired within like four months, which is like, to me, unheard of. <laughs> right? Like, I was like, I got this person hired in four months because I was like, no, Ooh, I'm not waiting. Wow. I'm an impatient person. So I was like, no. I owe like, you a cocktail on that one. That's a <laughs> achievement. That's yeah. Way. So, um, and they're queer. So, you know, like, I just was looking, you know, they, they you know, and they were still interviewed. So, really. Um, is this uh, your Elton John from the party? Yes, that is my Elton John. He was. He came he, as Freddie Mercury and the other one dressed as Elton John, and they were, they were extra. Way over there. Hilarious. Uh, so I it was it was a solid hire. I'm very happy with uh, with my team, a new team member. Um, so yeah, and you know, there's always positions coming up, and so just make sure you're you're doing the work. And uh, yeah. Thanks, Dan Danny, Alexi. I know you want to want to close this out. Um, I just I my heart is so full. I so appreciate the panelists. I so appreciate everyone who has joined us here. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the highlight of my week. Yeah, no, thank you all so much. Again, you know, I really appreciate everyone taking the time, especially outside of their work hours, you know, to participate on this panel, to do this webinar, so our community can become engaged and, you know, we can clear up CDPH. And it just looks like we have so many folks who are already, you know, ready to apply and take those tests. So um, I just really want to thank you all for your time um, and even to all of our participants, you know, who took two hours out of their day to join us. Um, Lexi, I'll pass it to you to close us out. I, um, yeah, don't have too much else to say. Just want to say thank you to everybody who participated and pre earlier. It was really great. It's also great to see some of your faces who I haven't seen in a really long time. Um, and just a reminder, we'll send out uh, a follow-up email and with resources, we'll do a, our best to re-record the actual uh, application process for you all. Um, and uh, yeah, so to get those, obviously uh, you can sign up for TransCommWorks or the California LGBTQ uh, Health and Human Services Network uh, listservs, and we'll be able to send those out. Um, and yeah, additionally, if you have questions uh, about this that we didn't get to address, feel free to send those our way. 
um, and for any specific uh, trans, gender nonconforming, intersex job seekers, you can sign up for Trans Can Work's uh, career services program through our website. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll be able to get some qualified folks in to work at the state. So um, thanks so much for all your time and energy um, and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Lexi. Thanks, Danny. Thanks for y'all um, hosting this and putting in all the work. Um, and Ariella. And yeah. Yay. Nice to see everybody. Nice to see you, Lexi. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Same here.